best of the best for the NES is one of the worst fighting games I've ever played, and one of the worst ever viewed. And as you'll recall, I couldn't even beat the first guy. Now later on, I did finally manage to beat him. But the whole experience left a bad taste in my mouth. Despite my reservations though, when I heard about the Super Nintendo version, I was hoping against hope that it might improve upon the dismal NES version. And did it? Ha 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 ha! It was such a terrific piece of gaming, as you can tell from the overwhelming enthusiasm in my voice. But seriously, no. This game is a pile of fucking garbage, just like its predecessor. And I'm looking forward to it about as much as I look forward to eating a Philly cheesesteak sandwich full of shit. So anyway, let's plow through this motherfucker. Best of the best for the Super Nintendo. You would think that when this game made the leap to the Super Nintendo, the graphics would get a huge upgrade. You would think that. But one of the most disappointing things about this game is that it barely looks any better than its NES counterpart. I mean, look at this opening! Okay, the title screen does look a bit snazzier, especially with a guy doing some martial arts moves. But come on! It's still not that impressive, especially when compared to other games. Best is hardly the word I'd apply to this crap heap. Unless you consider it one of the best letdowns ever, then yeah, it's the best, all right. Later in the character select screen, though, the characters do look a lot more detailed. However, this is the only area where the graphics look truly improved from the original. And some of these character models just look odd. This one guy here looks like a young Sting. But you can customize him so he looks like a coked out Fremen Charlie Sheen. Or this goofy black guy. Or this fart knocker here. And this Song Po fella here looks like a retarded roided out Macau. But the game designers saved the best letdown for the actual ring. Look at this crap. Really, it just screams uninspired. Okay, to be fair, they did add some small improvements. For example, they did add a referee who looks and speaks a little better. whoop de shit Give them a medal and shove it up their ass! And again, the fighters do look a little better to find on screen. But it's barely an improvement. It's like getting two birthday cakes made out of sawdust and aardvark semen. Only one cake has vanilla frosting on it, and the other doesn't. What difference does it make? One is just slightly less crappier than the other one. Alright, to give the game a little bit of credit, the graphics do occasionally have some nice touches, like these camera flashes in the background. Oh yeah, and occasionally a person or two pops out. Yet some of the shitty graphics still remain. Like the cosmic dandruff in the background that's supposed to be a crowd. So now you can occasionally pick out something resembling a human being. And again, there's Dick Tracy! Oh yeah, and there's a bit of movement in the foreground. But hell, this game still looks as bland as the NES version! Hell, they may as well have slapped the NES graphics onto this game and called it a day. Because they blow big time, my friends. However, if you think the graphics are a letdown, you ain't seen nothing yet. The controls are the same fucking piss pile they were in the NES version. That's right. In fact, I could copy and paste my criticisms from the earlier review into this one. Because it's the same shitty control scheme. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You have to press one of the buttons and a direction to attack. Literally, it's the fucking same as the NES version! Okay, in the NES version, that was a bit more acceptable because the controller only had two main control buttons. Here, though, there's no excuse! The Super Nintendo controller had six buttons! Six! A, B, X, Y, and the L and R buttons. Don't tell me they didn't have enough fucking buttons for this game! This was the perfect opportunity for the game designers to revamp the control scheme and make it more user-friendly. Assign a high, low, and mid-range attack for each button. But oh no, they fucking couldn't do that, the cunts! You know something, fellas? I'll tell you, I think the controls actually feel even laggier and worse in this version. How? You're not supposed to fail upwards, fellas. You're supposed to do better. Why even bother pointing this game onto a superior system if you couldn't improve it? I guess fuck up, fail up is their motto. 
Which brings me to the gameplay. Same shit, different day. No better options, no improvements. They imported every worthless part of the original into this game. The training that doesn't work, the boring stat screens, the worthless move lists. I really honestly can't understand why they put this game onto the Super Nintendo if they weren't going to make a token attempt to try and improve it. Or maybe I do understand the reason. And it all comes down to one word. Money! The almighty fucking dollar! Why sell a game once when you can sell it twice and make more buckos? Really, that's about the only reason I can see for them remaking this turd fest. It's like Hollywood's degenerate habit of making shitty, half-assed remakes to far superior films. Dust off some old property, give it a fresh coat of paint, and whammo! You made yourself another half a billion from raping the past. Only in this case, it's the worst of both worlds. Because not only did they have a shitty game to begin with, they made it even worse! And as if all that isn't enough, I swear this game is even more berserk and unpredictable than the original! And how, you might ask? Sometimes I won! Only I have no fucking clue how I did it! In some matches, I can't win to save my life. And in others, I kick my opponent's ass. What the fuck? What did I do? Did I land some magic blow at the right moment? Or is this game so poorly programmed that my opponents spontaneously pass out in the ring? Actually, if you think about it, I didn't win. You don't win a game like this. As War Games aptly said, the only winning move is not to play. And by playing, I already lost. Consider it a ferret victory. As for the music, are you surprised to hear that it sucks a fat one too? Of course you aren't! I'd play it for you, but I think you'd be better served listening to Penguin Queefs for three hours straight. So I'll just spare you the trouble! Finally, you may be wondering how this game stacks up next to the Genesis version. Well, it stacks up like a Jenga game in an 8.0 earthquake. In other words, it's a clusterfuck! I don't have to review it because it's pretty much the same train wreck the other two games are. You know, at this rate, I wonder how many more times it would take these boneheads to get it right. What, would they have to port this game onto the Sega CD to make it better? Or the Atari Jaguar? Or hell, the PS1 or the Dreamcast or the N64? No, I get the feeling they'd still blow it even if they ported it to the fucking PS5. So in conclusion, no matter what system you're playing on, your best bet is to avoid this game. No pun intended. With so many other fighting games out there, I'm sure you can find something better than this shit show. Mortal Kombat Special Forces is a fucking pile of junk. Pure and simple. This game is not only an insult to Mortal Kombat fans like myself, it's an insult to humanity in general and the universe as a whole. I could go on and on about how much I hate this stinky cunt nugget of a game, but I don't want to keep you guys here for the next 10 hours. So anyway, let's just get it over with. Mortal Kombat Special Forces for the PS1. They say that first impressions count for a lot. And in the case of this game, that's certainly true. Take a gander at this opening and ask yourself, would I really want to play the game after seeing this? kidding me here? I swear, when I first started up this game, I thought this was a joke. I really did. I was sitting there waiting for the real intro to come up, but no, this is the real intro. I mean, what the fuck is this shit? Is this like Austin Powers or Zoolander or something? If they meant it as a parody of spy movie openings, then great. But I don't think this was meant as a parody. I think they were serious. Talk about tone deaf. This opening even looks like shit. The graphics look so cheap and cheesy that I wanted to hide my eyes while I was watching it. And the in-game graphics don't get any better, folks. The main hero of this game is Jax. 
In Mortal Kombat 2, when his character was first introduced, he looked badass. But in this game, he just looks bad. Or like ass. Take your pick, my friends, because he looks like shit either way. Was this really his final character design, or did they just give up halfway through and say the hell with it? Then again, even rats know when to abandon a sinking ship. Not to mention that it's unbelievable how bad his character animations are. Jax couldn't move any more stiffly if Motaro rammed his horse dick up his ass and butt-fucked him for a week straight. As for the background, it's a warehouse. Oh, how original! Only seen that in about 50 million movies and games. They couldn't use Outworld or some more inspired setting? Nope, it's just another warehouse. And an ugly, bland one at that. So not only is the game boring to play, it's boring to look at too. Oh, and if you're hoping that the controls are any better than the graphics, you may as well shut off this review right now. Jax has two punches and two kicks. And guess what, sports fans? They all suck. In particular, his punches look really stupid. Is he punching at an enemy or swatting at a fucking fly? And his kicks ain't too great either. It looks less like he's fighting and more like he's working out his thighs. Um, this is Mortal Kombat, my man. Not fucking Leg Day. Oh yeah, and the game gives you some combos too. But the controls feel so laggy and imprecise that it feels like you can't pull them off half the time. Next we come to what I laughingly refer to as the gameplay. Ah, gameplay. This isn't a game you play so much as you suffer through like a bad case of stomach flu or a bum on the bus with the worst B.O. ever. Jax goes to a warehouse to stop Kano and his buddies. Okay. But this game tries to be some kind of half-assed version of Zelda 2 or Rambo for the NES. Apparently, you have to go around this place and beat up bad guys. Where it is? I don't know. For all I know, it's a fight club or a leather bar and Jax is trying to avoid having a bunch of horny gay guys plow his tight virginal black ass. In any case, Jax tries to avoid getting ramrodded in the rear and gains experience points. Experience in what, though? Feeling like a dumbass? Then yeah, in that case, you sure gain a lot of experience, all right. Otherwise, though, no. So anyway, you beat up bad guys to gain experience points and pull off more combos. Which seems totally pointless in light of the fact that he can barely fight. Not to mention that he gets a machine gun. Oh yeah, and apparently the game designers forgot that he can launch fucking fireballs and rip people's arms off. Kind of makes me wonder why he even needs a gun, but whatever. The camera angles are another big problem, and it makes it even harder to see enemies. Not only that, it makes it easier for the enemies to ambush you. Because that's so fair. Hell, the only way the view could be worse is if they cut out half the screen. What, were they trying to make it harder to move around? If so, then good job there, guys. What really sat my will to play this stink bomb, though, is the AI. It is without a doubt some of the stupidest AI I've ever seen in a so-called professional game. Let me give you two examples. Okay, I go into this room with a small staircase. If I go to the bottom, they can see me. But if I only go a couple of steps up to the top, suddenly they can't see me anymore. Jesus, this is as bad as Underground Mission! Christ, you know you've really lowered the bar in game making when you can't even do better AI than a shitty pirate game. And in the second example, you can even outwit an enemy by climbing onto a truck bed. What, is this fucking guy blind? Jesus Christ, they should have refunded gamers money for this shit. As if anyone would be stupid enough to actually buy this fucking flop. Hey, game designers, AI stands for artificial intelligence, not advanced idiocy. I don't see how even the game's most dedicated fans, <laughs> like there are any, could justify this shit. I don't have the foggiest clue what kind of playtesting was involved in this game. What, did the tester stick the game in his girlfriend's vagina, pull it back out and call it a day? In that case, you're supposed to playtest the game, not play with it! Oh, and just in case you were wondering, the music is crap too. This could only be called music in the loosest sense. Hell, I've heard many demos on the internet that sounded better than this. Overall, maybe if this game had nothing to do with Mortal Kombat, I would just let it go. But the arcade versions of Mortal Kombat 1 and 2 are two of my favorite games of all time. 
and to have this turd associated with them, however tenuously, is such a slap in the face. Midway really sold their soul on this one, and everybody involved with this game should be ashamed of themselves for putting the name Mortal Kombat on such a steaming pile of garbage. So in conclusion, a bad game is one thing, but a bad game linked to one of my favorite fighting game franchises ever is beyond the beyonds! If you're a Mortal Kombat fan, just avoid this clusterfuck like the goddamn coronavirus. And if you're not a Mortal Kombat fan, avoid it anyway because it's not like you're missing some forgotten classic. Originally, I was going to do this review as an April Fool's joke. But these two bosses I'm about to cover are so fucking ridiculous that they already are a joke. Therefore, doing it for April Fool's Day would be redundant. So let's go for broke and dive headlong into this lunacy. Stupid boss battles. Barbie for the Nez. Two bosses. Before I begin, I will say this. I don't envy the game designer's job. I mean, what the fuck do you do for bosses in a Barbie game? Have Barbie fight a comb full of tangled hair or Ken's plastic dick? I have no idea. So I can't totally fault them there. But having said that, I'll also say that these bosses really suck, even for an absurd game like this one. To begin, the first stupid boss our blonde bimbo faces is... Floating Clothes! Yes, Floating Clothes! Okay, to be completely fair, the game does have Barbie in a dream world. But let me tell you something there, sports fans. This game ain't no Inception. Hell, it's not even up to par with Dreamscape. Still, clothes? I mean, what's next? Barbie's shit-stained panties or a floating tampon? I just can't wrap my head around this goofiness. But I'll try. All right, you fight some old lady's clothes. And admittedly, these shoes here could put the hurt on you. How? You got me. Maybe they hit you really hard, or you get hurt from their sheer ugliness. But in any case, this is one of the earliest bosses you face. And as per video game norms, it's an easy one. Now the game gives you a weird attack. You throw what the manual calls a charm at the clothes and knock them out of existence. And this so-called charm has a weird arc. You have to hold down on the B button to launch it. And the longer you hold it, the farther the charm goes. But if you let go of the button, it just drops. Worse still, if you hold it for too fucking long, it drops anyway! I guess having Barbie just fucking throw the goddamn thing in a straight line would be too much to ask. So anyway, you have to take out these shoes coming at you. And you do this by hitting them once with a charm. Whammo! Done. From there, the boss is super easy. It just floats up and down like it's hopped up on cocaine. And while I'm on the subject of drugs, I bet the game designers did a Mount Everest-sized pile of coke! Because that is the only way you can explain a nutty boss like this. Now at this point, the only way you can lose the battle is to step under the clothes and get hit. Assuming you're not stupid enough to do that, you just hit the clothing a few more times and you win! Yeah, some victory. I feel really triumphant. Like somebody jammed the keys to the city up my ass. Next up, there's this gem of a boss. And you won't believe what it is, even after I tell you. A fucking pizza oven that shoots pizzas at you. There is nothing I can say that will make this sound more absurd than it already is. I mean, really? Just... Yeah. This might take the cake for the STUPIDEST boss I've ever faced! Or in this case, the pizza. Har har! Think about that for a moment. This was the idea they went with. I just can't, folks. No. Okay, uh, moving on. You have to defeat the pizza oven by closing three of its doors. The one on the bottom is already shut, though, so you only have to worry about the other three. Uh, yeah, thanks for making my job easier, I guess. Anyway, to beat this fucker, you have to hurl these stupid charms at the doors. Yes, the ones with the lousy arc. 
Hit a door once and it closes halfway. Hit it twice and it closes for good. Close all the doors and you win. Also, there's these floating pizza boxes that serve as platforms, so you can hop onto them to hit the higher doors. But I found that it's just as effective to stay on the ground near the oven and knock out the doors by tossing the charms higher. Close the second lowest door and the oven can't hit you with pizzas anymore. Bravo! After all, challenges are for sissies, bro. As far as difficulty goes, this is actually a pretty easy boss to beat. Unless you're low on health as represented by the Z's here, or you're bored out of your fucking mind, you should be able to dispatch this thing quickly. But I gotta ask, was this their first idea for the boss? Or did they have something even worse planned? Like a big cup of soda that launches straws or a gyro that craps lamb meat at you? I can't believe that nobody put the brakes on this idea because it is so fucking stupid! Even for a game set in a dream world! At the rate they were going, I'm surprised they didn't have you fight a fucking Chicken McNugget that launches dipping sauce at you. So in conclusion, you don't need to bother with these boss battles. Because they are too absurd to be endured. So I would give them a hard pass. Let me ask you something. Have you ever had a boss who was a pissy, pain-in-the-ass micromanager? You know, the kind that wanted you to do a job and wanted you to do a hundred little steps to accomplish it. Only then this shit had either forgot to tell you what to do, or they made the steps so needlessly complicated that it was impossible to complete the job to their satisfaction. And then when you failed, they rake you over the fucking coals for it. That's this level to a fucking T! I swear, this is one of the most persnickety fuck-up levels I've ever played. It is just damn near impossible to get it right. So anyway, let's get into it. Levels from Hell, Die Hard Vendetta for the PlayStation 2, The Holmes Observatory, Part 1. Now I will say this in the game designer's favor. At least they saved this shit show for the end of the game and not the beginning. Because if this level had been in the fucking beginning, I would have thrown something. It rubbed my rhubarb that fucking much! So anyway, a little quick background on the game's plot before we begin. Die Hard Vendetta is a non-canon sequel to the first three films. An older John McClane must do battle with Hans Gruber's son, Piet. Piet is working with a failed actor and military nut named Frontier. Really, game designers? That was the best name you could come up with for your arch-villain? What's his first name? Final? Anyway, McLean jumps onto a helicopter and is taken to the final battle at the observatory. Now by this point in the story, Piet is dead and Frontier turns out to be the main villain. Kind of seems stupid to me that you have to deal with this putz instead of Gruber's son. I think it would have been a nice callback to the first film to fight Piet at the Nakatomi Plaza in the previous level. But that's the plot, and that's what we're stuck with. So onward. Anywho, John starts out this level outside the observatory. And the proverbial shit hits the fan faster than you could say, yippee ki motherfucker! There are so many ways for this level to hand you your ass that I hardly know where to begin! But since I have to begin somewhere, let's start here. Okay, so you're outside the observatory, and there is very little cover out here. Now admittedly, the mercs guarding the place don't start shooting at you until you do, or until you get too close. But they are crack shots and can whittle down your health like nobody's business. Then there's the mines. Yes, mines. These dickheads mine the place! Step on a couple of them and McClane can kiss his nine lives goodbye. Alright, maybe you think enemy soldiers and mines aren't too bad. Hell, John even warns himself about the mines. Mines! Watch the mines, John! Watch the mines! Just avoid the boom booms and kill the bad guys and you're good to go, right? Not so fast there, hoss! There are two rocket launcher platforms on the roof of the place. Take a rocket hit or two and McLean will be picking glass out of his feet in heaven. Jesus! Is there anything else we can throw at McLean while we're at it? Why yes! A fucking helicopter! Which you have to take out in order to destroy a door and proceed further into the level. Why McLean can't just nuke the door with the rocket launcher is anybody's guess. 
Going back to the mercs, I tried a couple of strategies to take them out. Most of them failed. I tried for cover, but like I said, there's very little of it, and often these asshats can hit you anyway. Or you could try sniping the soldiers from a distance. Unfortunately, more often than not, this long-distance strategy fails, and these bad guys will whittle down your health because this aiming reticle is fickle. Plus, this game's hit detection is suspect, and you have to be very accurate. Under normal circumstances, caution would be the best strategy. But not here! That's right! The best strategy i found is to run in and gun down these schmucks. Yes, running in like a jackass will help you win the day. Nice to see that stupidity is a winning game strategy. About the only saving grace in this area is that when you kill the last guy, the game cuts to a Matrix-like scene of him going down. So you know you're clear of the mercs at least. Also, if you head to the right here, you can grab the rocket launcher off the box and smoke the chopper. Oh yeah, blow up these two launchers too before they give you a rocket-propelled anatoma! Assuming you do all this shit correctly, the chopper blows up as I said earlier and takes out the door on the left here. And it's the only cool, die-hardish thing about this level. So enjoy the brief moment, folks. Bear in mind, we are barely past the opening and this level has fucked you 50 ways from Sunday. But it isn't even close to done yet. As somebody once said, Welcome to the party, pal! Beyond this opening area, you head through this hallway and up this staircase to the next floor. And then there are two more troops who are crack shots in the roof here. Get up! And make fucking sure you take out the launchers beforehand. Otherwise, McLean is gonna get McNuked big time. Plus, make sure you pick up the circuit breaker from this one dead guy. From there, you have to snipe more guys from the roof. And their accuracy here is so perfect, it's ungodly. Never mind ungodly. It's unfair. Unless you're super careful, you're gonna get fucking killed fast. I swear, this part took me forever. You have to inch your way to the edge of the roof very, very carefully and kill these five cocksuckers. Oh my god, it's aggravating! Now, if there was a checkpoint at this part, it would be a bit more bearable. But this level ain't in the checkpoints. Or any other points, for that matter. So when you finally kill all these assholes, you can jump down to the lower level. Next, you come upon a badly injured security guard. I'll call him Mr. Mullet. And this fucking part pissed me off so goddamn much! for reasons that I will make clear later on. Now Mr. Mullet gives you the keys to get into the office on the roof. Oh yeah, and he also lets you know that the bad guys have planted five bombs in the building. And for the love of God, I beg you, do not leave him after you get the keys. Keep prompting him and he will give you a walkie-talkie too. Afterwards, you talk to Al while you go up these stairs and around this corridor. But watch out! There's more troops, and the walls are lined with bombs. Walk past a wall bomb with low health, and it's happy trails for McLean. Fuck you, game! Eat my shitty ass, you cunt waffle! I'm surprised they didn't line this area with more rocket launchers. Or a couple of hydrogen bombs, for good measure. Plus, there's no med kits or body armor anywhere nearby. I lost count how many times I died by this point. Hell, why count? Anything over 30 is just wasted breath. So let's say you're lucky. And dumb enough to keep playing. You get to this spot. And now what do I do? It's a dead end, right? You shoot the box and climb up the rope. Just don't accidentally jump off it or, yep, you guessed it, you either take massive damage or you get killed. Jesus, they couldn't put this fart knocker on the roof, now could they? No, that would be too easy. Okay, so you go back to the top, go to the office, open it, and yep, there's one of the suitcase bombs. Great! I'm surprised it doesn't blow up in my face. So anyway, this is a quick time event. 
And there's no room for error. Oh, and very little time, too. Press one wrong button or don't move fast enough. Kaboom. Back to the beginning for you. That's right. No mulligan, no checkpoint. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Jesus fucking Christ spinning on a porta potty. This level is fucking ruthless. Oh, and did I forget to mention that you need to equip the circuit breaker before you disarm the bomb? Failed to do so, and you can't even disarm the fucking thing. But the fun's not over yet. You have to turn this dome so that the ladder is facing this platform. Okay, that's easy. Also, you can deactivate the rocket launchers. Well, that's useless because I blew them up already. Alright. So you leave the office, go up these steps, and climb up the ladder. And be very fucking careful going down into the observatory dome. You have to lower McLean's fists, duck, and drop down slowly. Fall while standing and you don't have enough health? Yep, you're dead! Jesus, and still no checkpoint! Oh, but there is a medic kit in the office. Whoa-wee! How generous of them! I mean, come on! How much harder can this level be? Wait, don't answer that. You don't want to know. Okay, maybe you do. There's another bomb! And it takes even more buttons to stop. And you better have that circuit breaker equipped against sports fans. Really, game designers, would it have hurt you to put in one checkpoint before now? Just one? Even Hitler or Stalin or friggin' Kim Jong-un would have been more forgiving. So after a billion mistakes, you finally disarm the bomb and get to the last door before the checkpoint. And to the level's credit, you only have to defuse two bombs before you get to this checkpoint. Very kind of them! I'm surprised they didn't toss in the water jug problem from the third movie to give you some more grief. But this level has one more big fucking problem. Remember when I told you to make sure to get the walkie-talkie from Mr. Mullet? Guess what happens if you make a simple human mistake and forget to get it? You fail the whole fucking level! Fuck! Really, game? Really? I've seen some dick moves from other games. But this is just low, low, low. Think about it. You do it all right after a million failures, then blow it because the game doesn't have the fucking common decency to tell you that you need to get the walkie-talkie from the guard and call out. Or just, you know, automatically give it to you along with the keys. Unfucking believable This is criminal! Hell, the game doesn't even say in the level intro screen, Hey, you dumb fuck! Make sure you get the walkie-talkie from the dying guard and call out, or else you lose the level! And the real pisser is that this call is useless! Al can't help McLean. So why put this crap in there at all? Because they were too stupid to know any better, or were they genuinely being dicks here? I'd go with the latter. You know what? Fuck these game designers in every orifice with hot pokers. Really, this is just one of the cruelest things I've ever seen in a game. It is dirty pool. Uncalled for. I cry foul. Okay, so you finally do every fucking thing right. You get the walkie-talkie. You do everything else right. You go through the door. You get your checkpoint. It's finally, finally over. Hallelujah! So in conclusion, Die Hard Vendetta could have been a hell of a game. Unfortunately, it had to piss away what little goodwill it earned by churning out this piece of shit level. And from there, I'll just leave it at this. If revenge truly is a dish best served cold, I'd like to stick the game designers in a meat locker and make them play this fucking garbage level until their fingers snap off. I honestly thought that no game could be weirder than the A-Team for the Atari 2600. However, I was wrong. Not only is the C64 version of A-Team weirder, it's even worse than the other one. And yes, I can't believe I'm actually saying that. So anyway, let's get into it. The A-Team for the Commodore 64. Now there's only two graphic screens in the whole game. The introduction and the game screen. And to be charitable, both of them suck dead camel cunt. 
I mean, look at this. All you get are their heads. And you know what? I think the Atari version did a better job with Mr. T's head. Here it's just some yellow paint splashed on the screen. And as for the other characters' heads, well, they would have been better off just using stick figures. The worst one, though, has got to be Hannibal. Jesus Christ, just look at him! I know that's supposed to be a cigar sticking out of his mouth, but come on! Hannibal looks like George Washington sucking a dick! As for the playing field, it's a black void. So I guess I'm finding the A-Team in fucking outer space now. Great. You mean to tell me they couldn't have put in, like, a forest or a base or something in there? No, of course not. This is the pinnacle of lazy game design. For Christ's sakes, the online game Don't Shit Your Pants has better graphics than this. And that's just a text game with crude images. Amazingly, though, the controls are even worse than the graphics. When you start the game, your main character, I'll call him Jack. Jack runs back and forth across the screen when you're not controlling him. Now you can make a move left and right by pushing those buttons on the keyboard. Unfortunately, once you let go, he'll still keep on moving anyway. So in this context, the word control is something of a misnomer because you hardly have any. Basically, if you want to stop Jack from going in one direction, you have to go the other direction. Which means it's like playing Space Invaders or Millipede, but with worse controls. Oh yeah, and hitting the control button allows you to fire his gun. Wow, those are really amazing controls. Earlier I mentioned Space Invaders, and that's pretty much what this game is. Except instead of aliens, you're shooting the big fucking heads of the A-Team. I don't know what to say. This is just, this is, this is, this is stupid beyond words. I don't know how much paint thinner they were sniffing when they made this game, but I'm sure it had to be a lot. Essentially, you just run back and forth, dodging their bullets and shooting their heads. Really, that's it. It's sad to think that the Atari 2600 version of the A-Team actually has more varied gameplay than this. And at least with that game, I could laugh at its fucking nuttiness. But this game is so fucking lame that all I can do is sigh in sheer disbelief. They could have done so many different and better games with the A-Team. First-person shooter, third-person action, stealth game, driving game, fighting game. And what do they choose? Shooting fucking heads! Fuck you, Elwood Computers. You don't even deserve to be on the Z-Team. That's not even the worst part, though. Not only is this game cheap on the creative level, it's also cheap on the gameplay level. For example, if you get hit and die, you can immediately die again after respawning. The word cheap doesn't even begin to describe this fucking game. Worse still, when you get to the last head, it keeps flashing in and out, making it even harder to hit it. It's almost like the game designers are a cat toying with the mouse. And guess what? You're the fucking mouse. Alright, let's assume that you actually managed to beat a level. Then the next one pops up and it goes even faster. From there, the difficulty level ramps up so damn high that you're probably only going to get about three or four levels in before you lose the game. Oh yeah, and when you lose, the game gives you one more slap in the face. It actually has the nerve to thank you for playing. As if playing it is such a big privilege. That's not even the worst part, though. This is. Here, listen to the game's opening music. the fucking Star Wars theme here for the A-Team! What the fuck?! They can't even get their goddamn franchise music right! Either this is one big joke, or somebody's brain must have slid out of their fucking ass. How can you mix up the Star Wars theme with the A-Team theme? It's not like they sound the same. What's next? Are they gonna run the Superman theme over a Knight Rider game? In trying to sum up this game's utter shittiness, mere words fail me. Simply put, it is just a total failure on every level and should never be played. So in conclusion, I never actually thought I'd say these words, but go play the Atari version of A-Team instead. Yes, it's bad, and it's goofy, and it's totally insane, but my god, at least somebody put some effort into it! I never even knew that this game existed until a short time ago. And after playing it, I would be perfectly happy if I never knew about it. Because it is a worthless pile of shit. So anyway, let's get into it. Dragonheart, Fire and Steel for the PlayStation 1. 
If I had first played this game back in 1996, the digitized graphics might have impressed me. Actually, no. Fuck that. I think they still would have looked like shit. Okay, maybe I'm being a little too rough here. Bowen, played by Dennis Quaid, looks a lot like his movie counterpart. Then again, I'm a big Dennis Quaid fan, so they could give him his deranged hobo look from Enemy Mine and I'd still be fine with it. As for the enemies, um, yeah, they're not so hot. Apparently, we got half the cast from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Next, I suppose, I'll have to fight the Black Knight and the fucking Killer Rabbit. And then there's Thundar the Barbarian's retarded half-brother over here. Whatever. At this rate, I could fight a pile of animated shit and it would look better. To give the game some credit, the backgrounds do look pretty good. But there is a big problem with the second level background that I'll mention later in this review. Next comes the controls, and they sure don't do the game any favors. For one thing, Bowen moves slow as hell. Okay, maybe he's not the slowest character in a video game ever, but he sure doesn't hustle here, folks. Even when he's running. Now, if he were a medieval knight weighed down by armor, fine. But he's not. He moves with the slowness of a man who's uncertain whether he farted or sharded his pants. Now look, I can respect the uncertainty of a wet fart like anybody else. But come on, folks. Characters in video games have to move it. They can't just plot along like they're on a fucking Sunday stroll. And this guy. Christ. He couldn't move any faster if Draco set his ass on fire. Oh, and the fighting controls are a real laugh. In the time it takes Bowen to perform some of his moves, the enemies can get a cheap hit on you. Better still, if Bowen swings his sword too many times, he runs out of stamina and you're left vulnerable. Great! Ryu Hashiba, this guy ain't. After that Farago comes the gameplay, and here's where the game blows it big time. As if it hadn't blown it already. You start out in the ghetto version of the Ewok village, and your mission is simple. Get Bowen to the end of the level alive. Now there are two parts of the game that broke me. The first part is his log trap here. Oh sure, it looks easy to pass under, at first. But try to crawl under it and wham, you get knocked down and lose some life. So I tried again and again, and I got knocked down again and again. These sluggish controls are really helping me out here, sports fans. Finally I figured out after a bunch of failed tries that you have to roll under it. So I guess duck walking under it would have been too easy, right? Yep. Then you kill a hundred more medieval fucknuts, and this game gets real boring, real fast. Now you can collect power-ups to help you, like swords and these cups full of liquid. What are they, and what are they filled with? Fuck, you got me. Maybe they're filled with wine, or maybe they're filled with Sean Connery's piss. I don't know. And then there's these things. I don't know what the fuck they are. The Sankara Stones, or Firestar's Ovaries? But these sword power-ups do let you temporarily nuke your enemies, so I guess it's all good. Anyway, moving on, the first level ain't no masterpiece, but it isn't too bad. The second level, though... Oh, brother! It pissed me off so much that eventually it made me shut off the game. And you want to know why? I'll tell you. So level 2 starts out, and you're attacked by these annoying fucking birds and certain enemies that have the IQ of a lobotomized goat. And that was bad enough. But here's the second element that broke my will to keep on playing this game. Specifically, it's this watery background. As you can see, this level has a lot of water in it. But guess what these cheap cocksucking game designers did? They made some parts of the water standable, but in others you fall in and die! You fucking cunts! Of all of the cheap bullshit I've seen in games, this has to rank as some of the cheapest! It took me five minutes just to figure out that I could stand on certain parts of the water! And what kind of creek is this? In some parts it's only a foot deep, and in others it's a thousand? And correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't they teach medieval knights how to fucking swim? What, did Bowen skip that day along with the CrossFit? Shit, it would have been so easy for them to just make it so that you could walk across the water all the way through the level, or not. But no, they had to get cute. These game designers can go suck skunk pussy in hell. 
And as if that isn't aggravating enough, the game has this annoying heartbeat sound effect. Christ, even the movie Angel Heart didn't have this many heartbeats in it. Enough is enough! Just because the game is called Dragon Heart doesn't mean you have to have a heartbeat sound effect every two goddamn seconds. Oh, and the music ain't no prize either. Listen to this shit! You'd be better off having Donald Trump fart in your ear. Add to all that shit, the password system is insane! Look at all these letters and numbers! The angry video game nerd was right. Passwords should be simple. Not like I'm applying to the fucking CIA. Shit, I don't even think the CIA would be this complicated. By the time I got to the boss battle with Draco in the next level, I had had enough. If you want this game, you're welcome to it. Me, I got better games to play and better things to do. So in conclusion, this game is a loss. And it's a shame too because I think they could have made a decent game out of the Dragonheart film. Instead, they just pissed it all away. I suppose I'm a fool for expecting any kind of quality control in an unlicensed NES game. Or any quality, period. But even for an unlicensed piece of crap, this game has one of the most broken and frustrating levels I've ever played. So anyway, let's get into it. Levels from Hell, Titanic for the NES, the Rising Water level. You start the level out at the bottom of the ship. Now you can choose between Jack or Rose at the beginning of the game. But it really doesn't matter who you pick because they both control about the same. Which is to say terribly. So pick your poison, my friends, because it doesn't matter either way. And right from the start, you can see one big flaw in the level design. It's the water itself. Specifically, how it covers up both your hit meter and your lives counter. What cunt waffle made it so that you can't see this vital information? It is just crazy! At the rate they're going, they may as well have covered up half the screen too. There's also these falling metal things that can hurt you. What are they? Fuck, I don't know. The TX's IUDs or Megatron's butt plugs? And thanks to the rising water, there's no way to tell how much damage they cause, so you're just gonna have to fucking guess. So anyway, your mission in this level is to outrun the rising water and get to safety. Now this might have been a good idea for a level, if it was done with any degree of competence. But of course it wasn't. The first problem here is that there's no indication of where to go. You may think you need to go through certain areas like these hallways here, but no, they're dead ends. Oh sure, you can pick up some extra hearts here, even though they don't give you any extra life. Which doesn't make any sense. Whatever though. But these areas are traps. Take too long going the wrong way, and by the time you get back, the water will be too high for you to escape. So then you'll lose a life. Shame Jack and Rose can't swim! Oh wait, they fucking can. The game just conveniently forgot that fact. Worse still, the game doesn't give you a clue as to what is the correct path. That's right. It's a guessing game. And this little game will cost Jack and Rose their lives on more than one occasion. You know, if the characters had to go through this much shit in the movie, they never would have made it out of steerage. Would it have been too much to ask for an arrow or some other sign to point the way? Of course it would! What really wrecks this level, though, is the jumping. Simply put, it is absolutely fucking awful! Okay, now at first it doesn't seem too bad. You have to jump onto these platforms, climb onto them, and keep moving. But some of these jumps are really fucking bad. Like this one here. It may look innocent enough, but the shitty collision detection programming makes it nearly impossible! This is literally one of the worst jumps I've ever seen in a game. Honestly, I'm still not even sure about the spacing for this jump. As I said earlier, the poor collision detection makes it chancy at best. Hell, in this one part you can even climb through the floor and jump through part of the ceiling. 
So I guess the game designers spend all their time whacking off to elder porn instead of, you know, programming in some real collision detection. And again, the game gives you no clue where to go, so sometimes you can't even be sure where to jump. Oh lord, I'd rather eat out James Cameron's wrinkly old ass than play ten more seconds of this shit! Oh, but the fun's not done yet! Oh no! After that clusterfuck, there's this area with the ladders! And once again, the game designers don't give you a fucking clue where to go! Plus, they decide to be pricks and give you these mini ladders just to confuse you even more. Look, I know there's a lot of trial and error when it comes to playing video games. But there's trial and error, and then there's just fucking with you. And this is just fucking with you. The game designers are just punking me now. I know it. Bunch of fart-sniffing cocksuckers! And these ladders just keep going on and on and on! Apparently my heart's not the only thing that's going on! So is this fucking level! The funny thing is that this level is actually not that long, but it feels like it takes forever to get through because of these dead ends and frustrating jumps! What's even more odd though is that in this one part here, sometimes you die and get a checkpoint, and sometimes you go all the way back to the beginning. So even the checkpoints in this level weren't well programmed! Why am I not surprised? And again in this last part, just to fuck with you a little bit more, they throw in another trap hallway. But they do give you an extra life in the form of this Heart of the Ocean necklace. Gee, how generous of them! Too bad I can't see it on account of this fucking rising water! Then the game tosses in one more kick in the nuts. And how, you might ask? The game doesn't give you any hint that you have to go down this one hallway on the right here or else you'll drown. And then at long last, you finally escape this awful fucking level. And I wouldn't blame anybody for quitting the game at this point, because trust me, it doesn't get any better from here. About the only good thing I can say for this level is that you do get some limited continues. But the idea of continuing this level is about as appealing as continually lighting my balls on fire. And is it just me, or does the Titanic look like a toy boat going down in this continue screen? Oh, whatever. The bottom line is that this level is a complete piece of shit, and you'd be doing yourself a real big favor by avoiding it. So in conclusion, I wish an iceberg could have slammed into the building where this piece of degraded cunt cheese was made. Because at least that would have spared us all from this nightmare of a fucking level. Have you ever gotten a Christmas present from a relative, and it turned out to be the biggest, cheapest piece of shit ever? Like it's the kind of gift that you know the giver didn't put a moment's thought into. Yeah, well, that's what this game is. A big, thoughtless piece of crap that isn't worth the disc it's printed on. I mean, it's the kind of gift that makes getting nothing seem more desirable. So anyway, let's dive right into this holiday stink bomb. Home Alone for the PlayStation 2. Before we begin, I have to fess up and tell you guys that I am not a fan of the Home Alone films. I didn't like the first one, and I don't like any of the sequels either. Call me a Grinch or a Scrooge if you like, but I think the films are absurd crap. And besides, I think there are much better Christmas films out there. Die Hard, The Ref, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, even the venerable It's a Wonderful Life. Okay, putting that aside, let's focus on the game. From the start, you know you're in trouble when the movie came out back in 1990 and the game came out in 2006. Sixteen years, my friends. Almost nothing good comes from something made sixteen years after its source material's release. And then there's the graphics. Ha <laughs> ha! This game is so fucking cheap they couldn't even license Macaulay Culkin's face. Or Joe Pesci. Or Daniel Stern, for that matter. I'm not sure they were ever even approached. I doubt it. But if they were and they refused... Kudos to them. It would be a very smart move on their part to distance themselves from this shit bomb. My guess is, though, that they weren't. Either way, I bet they would thank Allah that they had nothing to do with this game. Alright, in fairness, Kevin does look kind of like his movie counterpart. So do the Wet Bandits. But really, the animated figures in this opening look fucking terrible. Like a super cheap 90s cartoon that barely lasted one season and was mercifully cancelled. I mean, really, was this honestly the best the game designers could do? Or did they just not give two shits? 
because however you slice it, it gets the game off to a really bad start. As for the in-game graphics, do you notice one big problem right away? If you've seen the first film, I'm sure you do. Namely, where's the fucking snow? This movie takes place around Christmas in snowy Chicago, yet there isn't so much as a fucking flake to be found. Oh, and there's no Christmas trees or holly either. This game looks about as festive as a North Korean labor camp. Like I said, I'm not a fan of the movie. But you would think they could get that much right. Apparently not. They were so cheap they couldn't even put snow into this game. Why even call this game Home Alone if it doesn't take place around Christmas? You could call it anything! Cheap piece of crap? Bargain bin bullshit? Give us your money, you fucking tool! Oh, and the character models? Christ, they are ugly and ungainly. Kevin looks like a fucking rubber doll. And the wet bandits look like animated farts. Even the house looks like garbage. This game is just an eyesore to look at. I mean, it literally hurts my eyes to look at it. Alrighty then. The graphics are a loss. How about the controls? How about fucking no? The controls are garbage too. Big surprise, I know, right? Like you were really expecting a miracle here, folks. I don't even think the son of God could save this dumpster fire. It's fallen that far from grace. Anyway, the game allows you to select from four different kids. But it doesn't matter which one you pick, because they all control like shit. In particular, the controls are very unresponsive when it comes to evading enemies and throwing certain weapons. Which is a big fucking problem when the game requires you to do both. I mean, these are supposed to be kids, and they're supposed to have fast reflexes, right? But sometimes I swear I think they have the reflexes of a fucking 80 year old with Parkinson's! Another problem is with selecting weapons. You do this by pressing the L1 and R1 buttons. But guess what? You can only go all the way to the left or all the way to the right. So you're telling me that the game designers couldn't program the item selection screen to loop back on itself? Then again, I doubt these fucking designers could tie their own shoes, let alone program a decent game. All of the aforementioned problems are minor, though, when compared to the gameplay. There's arcade mode for one player, and a two-player mode. So if you can find someone else who's stupid enough to play the game with you, then you'll both be twice as miserable. Ain't that lovely? Concerning the one-player arcade mode, I can honestly say that this is one of the dullest and stupidest games I've ever played. And I've played Color Dreams games, folks, so you know where I'm coming from. Anyway, your mission is to go around these maze-like levels and knock out the wet bandits. Whatever, fine. There were only two guys in the first film, but here there are multiple bandits. Okay, they needed to pad out the game, so I can accept that. But what I can't accept is this fucking nonsense. Get this. You have to secure the house by locking doors and windows. Which is great, except for one fucking thing. The bandits have already broken in! So tell me, what fucking good is it to lock down the house when they've already broken in? Makes about as much sense as installing smoke detectors in your home after it's burnt to the fucking ground! Alright, fine, whatever. We just have to accept it. Now to lock these doors and windows, you have to use a toolbox. And you only get two. Why two? Who the fuck knows? Maybe the game designers didn't feel like counting any higher. But like the Dirty Harry Cliffs level, they like the number. In any case, this is fucking stupid! You have to stand in front of a door or window, press square, and wait for it to be locked. Let go of the button and you have to do it all over again! Suck my dick, game! And once you manage to totally lock a door, you lose a toolbox. Um, why? Can't he just use the same tools in the same box over and over again? Not in this game's fucked up universe, he can't. Common sense! Who needs it? Run out of toolboxes, and you have to collect another two. Okay, they do respawn. But this mechanic is stupid. 
If he needs screws or nails, why not just grab some from multiple boxes? Oh, and this locking shit leaves you vulnerable to the bandits while you're waiting? I guess a short quick time event would have been too exciting. Or I don't know, just fucking locking the door or window? The same limit goes for weapons. Your kid can only collect a limited number of each one. Okay, this is a bit more reasonable. After all, he is a kid and you can't expect him to carry that much. These weapons include irons, flower bombs, springs, oil, tarantulas, and firecrackers. And each weapon does a different amount of damage. But trying to aim some of these weapons, like the tarantula, is a pain in the ass. Like here, they throw it in an odd arc that misses more often than it hits. On the other hand, the firecracker is easier to use and it does an obscene amount of damage, so you're better off using that when you can. Or better still, you can just shut off the game! But why be smart, am I right? Moving on, you have to lock 10 doors in this first level. If you don't, the bandits will just keep on coming. Once you locked up everything, you can take out the burglars for good. But here's the big problem. You have to defeat the bandits three times! And it is so fucking boring chasing these idiots down and trying to knock them out. I swear, this game's first level almost put me to sleep, even when I was jacked up on coffee. It is that fucking dull. Just find a burglar, knock down his life bar a little bit, wait, knock down his life bar a little bit more, wait, do it again. Am I supposed to be having fun doing this shit? I'd rather shove mistletoe up my ass and kiss Rudolph's floppy dick. Oh, and you only get a limited number of lives. Lose them all and you lose the game. Then again, if you started playing this game, you've already lost, bub. So why not go whole hog? Then comes the next level. And guess what? It's the same shit all over again. Only in a slightly more complicated maze. Yeah, because why change things up? Let's do the same dull shit over and over again. If you can stand more than two levels of this game, you're a better man than me. Because after two levels of this crap, I couldn't take it anymore, so I shut off the game. And the music. Oh lord, it's so bad and cheap. I don't want to subject you guys to this audio torture, but I'll be brief. That's awful! I'd rather work retail during the holidays and have the same three shitty Christmas tunes pumped through the speakers over and over again. One last point before I wrap things up. Like Beverly Hills Cop for the PlayStation 2, this game came out only in Europe. And again from Blast Entertainment. And again, it's a cheap cash grab from a previous decade's movie hit. Starting to see a pattern here? Nah. So in conclusion, the holidays are a time of giving. And if you play this game, it's going to give you something, all right. A big fucking headache. So in the spirit of giving, do yourself a big favor and give this game a hard fucking pass. Christmas means a lot of things to a lot of people. It means decorating the Christmas tree and seeing old Santa Claus again. It also means that it's time for me to review yet another shitty Christmas game. And this year, I've got a real doozy for you. Yet another craptastic Home Alone game. Which I look forward to about as much as I look forward to getting gang raped in a Turkish prison. So anyway, let's deck the halls with some boughs of folly. Home Alone for the Nez. Home Alone is many things as a game. A graphical masterpiece, however, is not one of them. To be fair though, I will say this. 
At least this game's graphics look a bit more like the movie than the fucking horrendous PS2 version I reviewed years ago. Which is really strange if you think about it, seeing how the NES is far inferior to the PS2. However, I'm not totally letting the game off the hook in the graphics department. It still looks like a hundred foot tall pile of dried out reindeer shit. For one thing, our young hero looks more like Dennis the Menace than Kevin from the film. And Kevin is supposed to be a little kid, yet looks almost as big as the background. He must have hit puberty and grew up super fast right as the game started. Also, the Wet Bandits only vaguely resemble their film counterparts. Beyond all that, even the house itself looks like garbage. No life, no real texture. It's as flat as an anorexic's chest. And of course, the game adds some rancid eggnog farts to the mix with a badly designed staircase or two. Yeah, you know the kind where it's hard to tell where you go up and down. Plus, some of these traps blend into the background, like this TV and the chandeliers. Clearly, making these things distinguishable was beyond the game designer's capabilities. There's yet another problem with the graphics that I'll touch on later. Right now, though, let's move on to the controls. Okay, these controls are pretty basic. You move left and right with left and right. Duh! You press up to move up stairways, and down to go down them. The A button picks up traps, and B sets them. Select selects traps in your inventory while Start pauses the game and brings up a status screen. Here you can see where Kevin and the traps are in the house and how much time you have left in this shitty ass game. Unfortunately, unlike other Home Alone games, you don't get a portable weapon like the BB gun to fend off the bandits. You just lay traps everywhere. Alright, this concept might not be so bad. Except, you can only carry three traps at a time. So you can't do the logical thing and stock up on them. Plus, you can only use traps a few times before they become useless. Nice to see the game designers artificially inflating the game's difficulty. I wish I could say that the game's sins stopped at the graphics and controls. But alas, that isn't the case. This flop really rams a yule log into your nuts with the utterly dreadful gameplay. And I am not exaggerating when I say that this is one of the worst NES games ever. It is so bad that it's going to be on Santa's naughty list for the next 10,000 fucking years. Take my word for it. So anyway, let's start with the game's bad points. Oh brother, the bad points. The game barely gives you 10 seconds to get used to the controls in the environment before the wet bandits rush in and nab you. Oh, but here's the best part. You only get one hit and one life for the whole fucking game! You may be wondering if I'm off my rocker when I say this, but no. It is the God's honest, my friends. No extra lives, no continues, no password. Zippo! If either of the wet bandits catch you one time, you lose the entire fucking game. No joke. How fucking cruel is this? Play this game? I'd rather have Santa ram a Christmas stocking full of broken candy canes up my ass. Oh, but wait, there's more. You have to suffer through this crap for 20 minutes. You never really know how long 20 minutes can be until you play a disgrace like this. Folks, this is the cruelest NES game ever. I can't think of another one that only gives you one hit and one life for the whole fucking thing. It's unconscionable. But the Christmas cheer doesn't stop there. Not only are you stuck in this fucking house for 20 goddamn minutes, most of the time you can't even tell where the wet bandits are. This isn't a game. This is a Chinese torture device that makes water torture look like a nice spring shower. Also, remember earlier when I mentioned another problem with the graphics? You can get away from the bandits by hiding in certain spots for a short time. Like behind this tree. But then the game doesn't show you where they are or even tell you. No, you have to guess. Oh, and the manual doesn't even tell you where they are. 
Thanks for the heads up. Worse still, you can't hide forever in one spot because the bandits will eventually catch you. Then again, if it gives me a reason to shut off this fucking game, that would be a blessing. It is just too boring and difficult to be endured. Even when I lay traps all over the place and hide, I still always fuck up and lose. Despite all these issues though, I did find a way to win the game. Want to know how? With a glitch! Yes, the only way I could beat this game was with a glitch. If you set it up right, you can trap these two idiots in this one area here. But I only found that out by looking on YouTube. And even if you do manage to glitch trap them, you still have to wait out the clock. So even by winning, you still lose because you wasted all that time. Finally, there's the music. And it's about as festive as a raging case of herpes. Here, listen to this crap. I guess it was too much to ask for some Christmas music or music from the film. Unfortunately, I don't even think Handel's Messiah could save this game from eternal damnation. As I've said in the past, I'm no fan of the Home Alone films. But I'd watch any of them anytime rather than play this Christmas fart bomb. So in conclusion, the game over screen says, oh no! And that is the perfect reaction to this puddle of festering rat puke. I'm oh knowing out of this game, and you should do the same. Some levels are bad, and some levels are terrible. But some levels go way beyond simply being bad and terrible. Some levels are pure fucking evil. And this first level from Back to the Future is pure fucking evil. It is one of the most vicious, unfair, fucked up levels I've ever had the displeasure of playing. So let's hold our collective noses, grit our teeth, clench our butt cheeks, and get ready to take it up the ass. Levels from Hell, Back to the Future 3 for the Sega Genesis. The first level. Now in the past, I've played some levels that could charitably be called hard. But I've never played a level that seems so perfectly designed to make you shut off the game immediately. This level... God! Mere words can't sum up my rage. Alright, let's take a deep breath, step back for a moment, and examine the scenario. To the level's credit, the one thing it does do right is that it somewhat resembles the film scene it's based on. As you'll recall, Doc Brown is in the Old West in the year 1885. The school teacher Clara Clayton is stuck on a runaway buckboard that is racing towards a cliff. And old Doc Brown has to ride in on his horse and save her before she goes over the edge. Okay, so far, so good. But then the good fucking stops. In fact, good's fucking brakes get slammed on real quicksville. In short, you aren't even given a fucking second to get used to the controls. Oh no, the horse just goes flying forward. Hey, game designers, could you just give me one cock-sucking second to get used to things? Of course not. Why be fair or decent when you could be total pricks? So off you go and wham! Right away you're hit with everything under the fucking sun. Birds, tomahawks, boxes, rifle cowboys, and rocks. Hey game designers, is there anything else we can drop on Doc Brown while we're at it? Maybe a few vials full of coronavirus or a couple of nuclear warheads. How about that, huh, fellas? Jesus fucking Christ with a side of crotch rot toast! This is beyond fucking unfair! Even the horrendous third level of Battle Toads gave you a moment to get used to the hover cycles. Even that shit stain of a tutorial and driver lets you control the car. But this infected cunt hair of a game won't give you anything. Except a splitting fucking headache and a permanent case of rage-induced psychosis. 
Worse still, in this level, you have no defense except ducking, jumping, and shooting forward or backwards. Plus, you can't move the horse left or right on a 3D plane to dodge obstacles. It is just a pure straight line of hell. Beyond that, you can't even see more than a few feet in front of you. And never mind fantastic reflexes. You literally have to have fucking godlike reflexes! There is so much shit flying at you so fucking fast that you don't have a prayer in the world. And this is the first level of the game, folks. The first. At this rate, the game may as well put a big fucking brick wall in front of Doc Brown and let him crash into it. Because you ain't going nowhere, Buster, and you can take that to the bank. And to all that, you even got pits you can trip on. Unbelievable! I don't know how many times I failed this level. I'm not even sure I want to know. After a certain point, it becomes academic. Call me crazy, folks, but I thought video games were supposed to be fun. How could this possibly ever be called fun? This is the very antithesis of the word fun. You know something? I think this may be a first. As in the first level from hell I can't complete. But I persevere. And let me tell you something, brothers. Trying to beat this level is literally one of the biggest wastes of time in human history. Because if the game isn't going to give me a fighting chance to win, I'll be damned if I'm going to care about it. And you know what else? This game is mistitled. Thanks to this level, you won't be going back to the future. In fact, the only thing you're going to be going back to is the fucking beginning. Over and over and over again until finally you say fuck it and shut off the game. Look, Back to the Future 3 may not have been the best movie in the trilogy, but surely it didn't deserve to be desecrated in this way. I honestly wish that this level had never been made because it is such a slap in the face to the film. They could have done a hundred other better ideas for this level. You know, like an overhead chase or an over-the-shoulder level where you have full control of the horse. Or, you know, maybe slow the fuck down and give players an actual fucking chance to get used to the controls. But no, they could not do that. Okay, so following five fucking billion failures, the only reward you get for your efforts is two lousy success screens. Wonderful! I feel like I climbed to the top of Mount Everest just to have a bird shit on my head. After getting through this experience, I have just one question. Is there anybody out there who's crazy and stupid enough to play the rest of this game? Because if there is, they need the men in white coats to ship them off to the nearest fucking funny farm as soon as humanly possible. So in conclusion, you know what kind of people like this level? Buttheads. That's who. So don't be a butthead and don't waste your time with this fucking fart fest. I like NARC. It's one of those crazy arcade games that only could have been made in the 80s, during the height of America's war on drugs. But even though I have a soft spot for it, the final boss battle ends the game on a sour note. So anyway, let's get into it. Stupid boss battles. NARC for the arcade. Mr. Big. The final boss battle starts out in Mr. Big's office. Now our hero, Max Force, has killed about 80,000 drug dealers and addicts. So naturally, the game expects you to kill another 80,000 before you get to the final boss. And this last fucking part is next to impossible, seeing how the game throws everything up to and including the kitchen sink at you. Look at this! There's a billion fucking guys gunning for you. And as if all that isn't enough, the head honcho, Mr. Big, makes an appearance. He races onto the scene in a wheelchair like he's fucking Speedy Gonzales and pelts you with enough firepower to make you shit lead for a year. Jesus! This game does not give you a chance! And even if you have a bunch of these rockets here, it's still hard to nail this dicksicle because he moves so fast. And get this! You have to blast the guy three times with rockets to take him out. And each time you nuke him, he crawls away and comes back with another well-armed wheelchair. I'm sure disability advocates are gonna love a game where you nuke a crippled guy in a wheelchair three times. Oh, but he's a hell of a guy. Not only can he survive, 
three rocket blasts. He also has extra wheelchairs handy. My man is nothing if not prepared. Oh, but if you run out of lives, you have to restart this whole section all over again. Joygasm! Anyway, when you finally beat Professor X's long lost brother, he drops a gold key card. Then you're granted access to the final area. And get ready for this boss, folks, because wow! I'm speechless. What can I say? This boss looks like my old high school gym teacher got ass fucked by a UFO. All right, looks aside, I can live with a weird looking boss if he plays fair. This fart sucker doesn't play fair though. Right away, he crashes into you and he can quickly eat up all your lives. Oh, and you can barely walk away fast enough to avoid this thing. Plus, this head likes to pin you in a corner and cheese the living shit out of you. Because that's fair. You know, if I had a big fucking head coming at me, I'd be running away. But that's just me. So anyway, you have to shoot this fucking thing with your guns and rockets. And by the way, I hope you have some rockets left. Because this battle will be a hell of a lot harder without them. And of course the game in its infinite kindness doesn't give you any more in the final room. You can only get more rockets by dying, and even then you only get five. Nice. This game is such a lovely quarter eater. Now you can shoot this thing normally, or you can jump and blast it in the sunglasses with a rocket. When you blow off its glasses, it reveals flaming eyes. And here's where the boss really becomes a cheap bitch. These fire blasts that come out of its eyes can kill you like nobody's business, and the boss just keeps on coming. Add to all that, there's literally nowhere to hide in this room. All you can do is walk for it, jump, and shoot it repeatedly in the eyes. Or stand your ground, jump and shoot repeatedly, and get annihilated. Of all the boss's forms, this second one is the toughest. Plus, after you die, it'll keep plowing into you like it's rubbing it in. Yes, you beat me. No need to ram fuck my corpse. In any case, when you hit it enough times, its fucking head blows off in a mess of blood and flesh and reveals its final form. A big goofy skull with eyes and long vertebrae. Oh Lord. This game may be anti-drug, but I'm sure the game designers weren't practicing what they were preaching. Anyway, it starts spinning around like it's tangoing on the dance floor, and sometimes it'll spit tongues at you. Now admittedly, this third form can be almost as bad as the second one because it moves really fast and twirls around like a cocaine-fueled merry-go-round. And the only way to knock it back and get some room is to blast its bombs with more rockets. However, if you stay near the bottom of the screen and keep shooting, you can usually blast off its vertebrae quickly, which is the only weak point. Destroy enough of them, and you win. But even as it dies, it can still cheap shot you. Come on, game! Stop being a cunt! At long last, the damn thing is dead. Oh, but the fun's not over yet! You have to get out of the room quickly, or else these fucking insects come out of Mr. Big Skull and attack you! Okay, you can kill them, but it's best to just get the hell out of there because they just keep on respawning. Instead of Nark, they should have called this game Dick! The next room is the vault, and it's the last room of the game. And the game says, Jackpot! Crackpot would be more accurate! But anyway, you collect a bunch of gold and win the game. Then the game gives you one last ending screen, saying that this is a training mission. Training for what? To kill a big head? Yeah, I'm sure the DEA is training its agents to do that. Oh yeah, and it also says to contact your local DEA recruiter. Well, let me tell you something. If some kid came in telling me that he wanted to join the DEA so he could blow up big heads with rockets, I wouldn't be signing him onto the force. Instead, I'd be signing him into the nearest funny farm.
So in conclusion, I wish this final boss battle had been as enjoyable as the rest of the game. However, it doesn't detract from the overall experience that much, and I suggest that you seek this game out. Waves 9 and 10 are insultingly awful in their insane difficulty. But the final boss battle insults the player by going way too far in the opposite direction. Like the rest of the game, it's a complete travesty to the greatness of Indiana Jones. So anyway, let's get into it. Stupid boss battles. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom for the NES. The final battle. The final battle starts out on the rope bridge from the movie. Now to be completely fair, they did at least get that detail right. I mean, there wasn't a fucking door in front of the bridge. Also, arrows didn't fly until later on. But it's close enough for government work. Though for some reason the arrows can't kill you, they can only stun you. Don't ask me why! So okay. You rush up to Molaram and he throws flaming hearts at you that you can whip. If they hit you, they can stun you briefly, but you won't lose a life, unlike the arcade version. Alright, so it's a bit of a deviation from the film, but it's not too bad. Anyway, you finally get to Molaram. And this is the part where you'd expect some kind of fight. Only guess what? You don't get one. What the fuck? I'm not kidding! You whip Molaram once and the bridge collapses. Seriously? Or you can even walk into him. That's right. Walk into him. Actually, calling this a boss battle may have been a misnomer on my part, because there is no fucking battle! Alright, if you have the knife, you can cut the bridge, which is very movie accurate. Uh, yeah. Although Indy doesn't get a chance to say his great line, Molaram, prepare to meet Kali! In hell! But to call this battle anticlimactic would be an insult to the word anticlimactic. Even the arcade version was tougher, though just as brief. Next comes the hanging rope bridge. And again, it's at least somewhat movie accurate. So now you think there has to be some kind of big battle, right? Right? Nope. You can literally defeat Molaram again by walking into him. Or you can whip him to death. What? I don't fucking believe this! Even the T-1000 boss fight in the Game Boy version of T-2 is more of a challenge than this. Hell, the final Molaram battle from Indiana Jones' Greatest Adventures was better than this. At least in that battle, Molaram tossed projectiles at you and the bridge slowly collapsed, which added to the challenge. They couldn't have done something else more challenging and interesting? Maybe do fisticuffs, or dodge Molaram's flaming hearts, or even have falling thuggies like the film. Nope. Again, even the arrows don't kill you. Hell, they don't even knock you off the bridge! Why make this battle so easy? That's my question. Was it penance for the impossibility of Waves 9 and 10? Or did they run out of time? Or did they just not give a shit? Personally, I think it was option 3. Worse yet, if he outruns you and makes it to the top first, you still don't lose or fail! He just disappears in a puff of smoke. The only way this battle could be easier is if Molaram committed suicide or got killed by an arrow from one of his own men. When you finally get to the top, you're treated to one of the lamest endings in video game history. The game says, you win. Oh, but if you whip Willy and bring her near Indy, you get, you win, big man. Oh, what an improvement. This is certainly worth all the fucking time I wasted playing this piece of shit. Then it adds up all your points and you go back to the beginning. In short, this boss battle and the game as a whole belong in a museum. Yeah, a museum full of shit! So in conclusion, is there any easier battle in video game history? The Incredible Hulk for the Genesis, maybe? But like that game, this one commits the sin of having a far too easy boss battle. And I don't see how you can need any better reason to avoid this game altogether. Now, I've covered a number of Christmas games in the past. And yes, there were some real turds floating in that bowl of Grandma's eggnog. But even some of them had the virtue of being so awful, they were at least memorably bad. This game, however, can't even muster up enough badness to reach that level. In short, it's a lazy, forgettable pile of crap that will leave your memory mere moments after you stop playing it. 
So let's dredge up this crusty Christmas cunt nugget and put it to bed once and for all. Elf Bowling for the PC. Let's face it, folks. This is a really fucking stupid idea for a game. I mean, what deranged waterhead really thought there was a market for this thing? I'd like to know! Okay, to be fair, I like bowling a little bit. But I'm not going out of my way to watch a bunch of bowling games on ESPN. And elves? Really? This doesn't even work as a novelty game! Alright, so the graphics are the best part of this game. I say best, as in they barely fucking tried! Now the game's premise is very simple. The game is one title screen and a bowling alley screen. You're Santa, and there are elves as bowling pins. So anyway, your job is to knock them all down. And yes, the game is literally that paper thin. This is it, my friends. Finito! The whole shebang! You're looking at it. Admittedly, to give the game a little bit of credit, sometimes the elves do have goofy animations that are funny. For example, they fart. Hey, Elliot farted. <laughs> or sometimes they moon you. <laughs> and Santa looks pretty good. But then again, how do you fuck up Santa Claus? Even morons can get that much right. As for the controls, they're equally simplistic. When you're on the bowling alley screen, a light trails across these little arrows. At whatever point you like, you press spacebar to throw the ball. And that is literally it! You can't control the speed of the ball or the spin or anything like that. I suppose I should comment on the gameplay, but there's hardly a game to play here! I literally just summed it up earlier! You just wait for the light to get to a certain point, hit spacebar, and throw a ball. Rinse, lather, repeat. Really? There is nothing else to this game! I've seen homemade Flash games on the internet that had more depth and creativity to them! Now I really, really tried to give this game a fair shot. However, it's so fucking boring to play that I couldn't even complete one match. I'd rather wipe my ass with a belt sander and douche it with Everclear than play ten more seconds of this shit! Oh yeah, and did I forget to mention that this game came out in 1999? Not 1989, or even 79. If they were any more behind the times, they'd be in the fucking Stone Age. Above all though, what really blows my mind is that they made several sequels to this game. My question is, WHY?! Was anybody on God's green earth really clamoring for more helpings from this festering dung heap? I can't believe they released the first one, even as a joke! <laughs> it is just one of the biggest, most worthless wastes of time ever made. In short, if you had a choice between playing this game and fucking a Christmas fruitcake, fuck the fruitcake! So in conclusion, Elf Bowling is a dud. A gutter ball. A no-strike game. You get the picture. Just give it a hard pass and play a better game. And on that note, I'd like to wish all of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Hopefully next year, we'll all be playing better games than this one. I never even heard of Santa Claus Saves the Earth until recently. And after playing it, I would have been quite happy if I never heard about it at all. I mean, I thought Days Before Christmas for the Super Nintendo was a piece of shit. But that game is a fucking masterpiece compared to the other catastrophe that is this game. So anyway, let's get into it. Santa Claus Saves the Earth for the PlayStation 1. I have to give the game designers some real credit here. If they wanted to make Santa Claus look like a satanic serial killer, then mission accomplished! I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Santa Claus supposed to look jolly? Not like he's ten seconds away from sucking your soul out of your asshole? The creepiest part of Santa's looks, though, has got to be his black eyes. It reminds me of Quint's description of sharks from the first Jaws movie. He's got black eyes, like a doll's eyes. When he comes at you, doesn't seem to be living. Yep, that describes this monstrosity perfectly. 
And believe me, sports fans, the background graphics don't look any better. If this game came out in the mid-90s, it would be at best, eh, middling. But this game came out in fucking 2002, folks! 2002! So at that point, there's really no excuse for such shitty graphics. Even in the first level, the graphics look flat and pixelated. There's no life or texture. Shit, I doubt this would pass the sniff test for a Super Nintendo game, let alone a PS1 title. I think the game is supposed to look merry, but the backgrounds look about as merry as a Siberian gulag in minus 80 degree weather. Christ, say what you will about Days Before Christmas, but at least that game somewhat captured the Christmas spirit. This game doesn't have any spirit though, folks. It is dead from the inside out. Now there is no question that this is a fucking ugly game to look at. But even uglier than its looks are its controls. Santa moves very slowly. Like he just dropped a load of Christmas fudge in his pants before the game started. I mean, I know he's a fat dude, but could he hustle just a little bit more? After all, the Earth is at stake, right fellas? Worse still, the game has that weird, imprecise zero-g jumping that will drive you crazy when you try to time jumps. Oh, for fuck's sake, after all these years of video game development, you'd think they could perfect jumping controls. But nope, it sucks as much as an ocean game. And if you get the snowflake power up here, Santa turns into an LSD freak and it becomes even harder to control his jumps. Funny, I thought power-ups were supposed to help you play games. Not make it harder! Oh, fuck it. Why do I even bother trying to criticize such points? It's like criticizing the Hindenburg after it went up in flames. Plus, the game has some annoying control quirks. One example of this is when you want to jump onto a pole. You can't just jump and automatically hold onto it. Oh no, that would be too simple and decent. Instead, you have to hold onto the X button, otherwise Santa falls. Gee, thanks! This game is the gift that keeps on giving. Like an incurable case of syphilis. Another annoying control quirk comes with this bag attack. Every time Santa does it, he goes backwards for some reason. Which makes it even harder to hit enemies. Why is this so? I don't know. Maybe they like Michael Jackson's moonwalking, or maybe the game designers are sadists and they want to make things even harder. Who the fuck can say? A third annoying quirk is these projectile attacks. You get snowballs and tomatoes? Oh, who the fuck cares, whatever, he can throw his own shit at the enemies for all I care. Anyway, for some strange reason, you can throw the tomatoes really fast, but not the snowballs? Instead, you have to hold down on the circle button to throw the snowballs. What's the difference? I guess just letting Santa Claus hurl snowballs fast would have made the game too enjoyable to play! And to make things even more fucking aggravating, these smart fucking tigers will jump over your projectile attacks. Alright, so the graphics and controls are really terrible. But now we come to the real nightmare, folks. The gameplay. And boy, is it a doozy. The title says that Santa Claus has to save the Earth. But as the Crappy Games website says, this is a lie. Apparently, some evil fairy sends Santa Claus to another land and he has to escape before Christmas. So Santa Claus doesn't have to save the Earth. Which is fine. Because in this fucking game, Santa Claus has enough trouble just saving himself, never mind the Earth. Now your mission is to go around, collect keys, and open doors. Wow, what a thrill! You'd think for a game called Santa Claus Saves the Earth, they'd give Santa something more substantial to do. Like, I don't know, save the fucking Earth? But no, Santa is reduced to opening doors like some kind of half-assed locksmith. Bravo! Next, I suppose I'll have to pluck the ingrown hairs out of Mrs. Claus's twat! And just to show how bad this game is, they can't even make a key look like, you know, a key? Great, so they can't even get something that simple right! But never mind that. This game is boring. I mean, really boring. In the first level alone, you have to backtrack like a motherfucker to get these keys. And what's even more annoying is that the game tosses in all these jumps where you can't see where you're going. Oh, good As if they couldn't make the first level aggravating enough! Whatever happened to easing players into the game with the first level? You know, letting them have a little fun? I guess the game designers must have missed that day at video game school. Even more aggravating, the first level is designed like a maze. 
so you have to constantly go around in circles like an idiot to open these doors. Look at this! A simple jump and boom, I could get the key. But no, why make it easy on me? Like I've said before, I always love it when things are more complicated than they need to be. Add to all that fun, they have cheap-ass enemies and spikes placed below you, so you're virtually guaranteed a cheap hit. This level is about as fun as drinking eggnog after Santa has taken a big steaming shit in it. It took me more than an hour to beat this first level because of all the cheap tricks this game pulls. Then I played level 2, which took me about 5 minutes. And why, you might ask? Well, because I figured out this game's bullshit. Just get this one key and get the fuck out of there. Oh, and by the way, what the fuck is up with these enemies? I mentioned the tigers earlier, but they have cavemen and these blue owl things? Jesus, I think the game designers were tripping some major balls when they made this clusterfuck. After I beat level 2, I was done with this game. Believe me, I know a bad game when I see one, and I knew there was no way in hell this game was going to get any better. The music ain't no prize either, ladies and germs. Listen to this junk. Music like this is what the mute button was invented for. There's one other point I'd like to mention before I wrap this review up. Like Beverly Hills Cop for the PS2, this game came out only in Europe. So once again, we Americans lucked out. But then again, I didn't necessarily luck out because I actually got a hold of this game and played it. So maybe I would have been luckier if this game never got past the development stage or every copy got buried under a pile of nuclear waste. In the spirit of Christmas, however, I would like to say that there is one good thing I did get out of this game, and that is a newfound appreciation for the games I did enjoy playing and reviewing this year, such as Hotline Miami. Not to mention my profound relief that they never made a sequel to this turd fest. So at least there is still some hope in the universe. So in conclusion, this has been a really crappy year overall, for more reasons than I need to say but I'd like to thank all of my viewers for their continued patronage and support. I truly hope that next year will be better than this one. In closing, I wish all of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. This holiday season, I wanted to do something I haven't done in a good long while. Namely, review a Christmas game that doesn't make me lose my shit. And believe me, with all the crummy Christmas games out there, that's no easy feat. Fortunately, though, after a prolonged search, I think I found a candidate. Santa's Christmas Caper. Now, it may not be a classic, or even great, but at least it's good. And seeing all the Christmas garbage I've covered in the past, that's enough for me. So anyway, let's get into it. Santa's Christmas Caper for the Amiga. This game's graphics may not be anything to write home about, but they look good enough to get the job done. And in the game's favor, I'll say this. Certainly they are more festive than the unholy collage of puke that is Santa Claus Saves the Earth. That game looks about as festive as a moldy Christmas stocking full of diarrhea-flavored candy canes. Of course you got Santa Claus. And yes, he's tiny. But at least he looks jolly. And the game actually has some holiday images. You know, Christmas type stuff. Alright, some of the levels do look a bit trippy. Especially with a level made of chicken drumsticks and wieners. Um, maybe it's meant to represent Christmas dinner. However, it is sometimes hard to tell what you can stand on and what you can't. But aside from that annoying problem, there are no other major visual gaps. I also like the look of the enemies. There's toy copters, moons or something, and these purple bouncing blobs among other enemies. They're certainly unique to say the least. As for the controls, they're simple. You move left and right with the corresponding directional buttons on the keyboard and jump with up. Now Santa's jumping is alright. A bit floaty, but good enough for a platformer like this. 
and your sole weapon is snowballs that allow you to temporarily freeze enemies and move past them without damage. But you have to get past them quickly before they defrost, otherwise you'll lose a life. Now you briefly get a shield at the beginning of the levels and in certain parts, so you can take some hits. However, once it runs out, it's one hit kill city. So you have to be careful. As for gameplay, this is a very short game. However, I think it strikes a nice balance in terms of difficulty and length. It's not ridiculously simplistic like Elf Bowling, nor is it overly complicated like Santa Claus Saves the Earth. In fact, I like to think of this as a better version of the latter game. Okay, so your mission in each of the seven levels is to collect a number of presents and get to the exit without getting killed. Simple, right? Well, not quite. The presents are scattered all over the levels, sometimes in hard to reach places. And you have to navigate past a bunch of dangers to get them. Overall, I feel the game's challenge is right on the money. It's fairly tough, but it isn't brutally hard. And the game gives you multiple lives, but no continues. However, it's not too long of a game, so I think that's fair. Also, some of the jumps are a bit tricky. Despite that, I like the challenges the game throws at you. After all, if the game was too easy, you wouldn't have as much fun beating it, now would you? In addition, the game has some decent tunes. Here, listen. is well done and it certainly puts me in the Christmas spirit. My only real gripe with the game is that the ending is weak. All you get is one screen that says, Congratulations, you have completed the game. Game over. Really, fellas? You couldn't have given me something a bit more substantial? It's like saying, Congratulations, you just farted. Game over. Funny enough, I think the title screen actually feels like a better ending than the actual ending. But at least the ending is spelled correctly. High praise, I know. Overall, Santa's Christmas Caper is not the kind of game you play for the ultimate gaming experience. But despite that, I still think it's a good Christmas-themed game to play around the holidays. And as such, I recommend it. So in conclusion, it's nice to wrap up the year with a good Christmas game for a change. And on that positive note, I'd like to wish all of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Star Trek V was a terrible movie, though I do think it has some merits in spite of its many flaws. However, I can't say the same for the NES game that was made from it. And I sure as shit can't say the same for the awful fucking boss battle that wraps this game up. So anyway, let's get into it. Stupid Boss Battles, Star Trek V for the NES, shaka -ri. Star Trek V for the NES was never officially released. Seeing how the movie tanked big time though, I'm not surprised the company that made the game, Bandai, threw in the towel. What does surprise me, however, is that they gave up on the game when it appeared to be damn near finished. You do all this work only to junk it near the finish line? Yeah, I guess so. Now one might argue that it's not fair to cover a boss battle from a game that wasn't released. But I say bullshit. I bet this was either the final version or very close to the final version of what was going to be released. So as far as I'm concerned, it's fair game. And to give the game designers a little bit of credit, I have to say that I don't envy them their task. I mean, the so-called god in the movie turned out to be a big fucking head that shoots lightning out of its eyes. Not exactly the stuff of great bosses, to be sure. So in a sense, the movie shot them in the foot from the word go. But having said that, I will also say that I think they could have done something better than this. Like maybe the aborted rock monsters that Shatner originally tried to put in the film. 
Or hell, fight Cybok or the Bird of Prey or even just dodge lightning balls from the sky. Yes, they are deviations. But this is one case where I wouldn't blame the game designers for ignoring the movie, especially seeing how they had so little to work with. Alright, moving on, let's focus on the battle. Like the film, Kirk has to face Shaka Ri, the fake god. Unlike the film, though, he gets a phaser. Which I think is smarter than listening to that dummy Cybok and not taking any weapons. But anyway, Kirk goes through this rocky hell and comes upon the fake god as a final boss. And what does it look like? Yep, you guessed it! A big evil fart cloud in the shape of a skull! Really? This was their best shot. Well, I will say this much. If you ever wanted to have William Shatner fight a fart, now's your chance! Alright, ignoring the fact that God looks like something I blasted out of my ass after eating too much Taco Bell the other night, how is the battle itself? Well, this is a stupid boss battles video, so I'm not exactly going to be giving it a bunch of sloppy kisses, now am I? No, this battle is a shit show! Anyway, get this. You have to shoot the fart cloud with your phaser several times. Which is hard to do because this fucking noxious bog goes flying around the screen like Speedy Gonzalez on meth. Oh, and let's not forget that along with flying around like crazy, the boss tries to shit on you. Yes, a fart tries to shit on you. I can't make this nuttiness up. Alright, fine, whatever. I can live with erratic bosses. But here's the thing. In their infinite wisdom, the game designers decided to give your phaser limited range and power. So if you come into this battle with little to no phaser power, it'll be a hell of a lot harder to hit the fucking thing! Brilliant! Is my phaser powered by a Chinese Walmart battery or what? They couldn't just give you unlimited distance shots like damn near every other science fiction game? No! Why make the game fair when we could kick you in the dick? Now maybe this battle might have been bearable if they had made the cloud smaller and gave you more room to maneuver. So naturally they did the exact opposite of that. Of course! Why do I have a feeling these game designers were bullied as kids and they wanted to get their revenge on all of us by making our lives miserable? Okay, so you fight this fart. And to be fair, there's no time limit. But guess what happens if you lose? You don't die. Instead, you get beamed back to the Enterprise. Um, how and why? If you'll recall the film, the Enterprise transporters got blasted offline by the Klingons and they couldn't beam Kirk back. So instead, he was beamed onto the Bird of Prey. But then again, as I said, the film hamstrung the game designers. So I won't grill him for that one. However, you have to go back to the beginning of the level and go through this aggravating maze area all over again. That I will grill them for. Because I'm sure it would have been oh so difficult for them to program it so you appear at the boss again. Anyway, after a couple of fails, I managed to blow up the fart cloud and win. Hooray! Kirk saves the universe from bad gas. My hero! Next, I suppose he'll be fighting a mutant version of his toupee while singing Rocket Man. Unfortunately, you don't get an ending, since I guess they never got around to programming one. The game just regurgitates a couple of lines of text from the opening cutscene, Falcon misspelling and all, and gives you a couple of pictures of the Enterprise crew. Then again, if the ending involved a shitty version of Row, Row, Row Your Boat, maybe we were lucky not to get a real ending at all. If only we were lucky enough to have the game disappear for good and be spared yet another crummy boss battle. So in conclusion, this is far from the worst boss battle I've ever played. But that doesn't mean you should waste your time trying it out. Unless you have a burning need to fight farts. The arcade game Shinobi has some good boss battles in it. But out of all of them, this third one is the least of them. Now, admittedly, it's not the toughest fight in the game. But it makes up for it by being a really cheap pain in the ass. So anyway, let's get into it. Stupid Boss Battles. Shinobi for the Arcade. Nandora. 
Before I begin, I have one question. What the fuck is a Mandara? Hang on a second, I'm gonna go Google it. I'll be right back. Okay, according to this one page here, Mandara was once a Hindu holy man who just wanted to live in peace. But apparently the baddies weren't happy with that, so they turned him into this... this... thing. What the fuck is this thing? Seriously, what the fuck is it? Were they on drugs when they made this boss? And if they were, could I try them out? Because I'd be getting fucking high as shit from them, I know that. The first two bosses, Ken-O and Black Turtle, were pretty good. But this thing... FUCK! If our hero faced Joe Biden's withered nutsack, I think that would have made a more comprehensible boss! Come on, man! The problems with this battle start out right away. Okay, so our hero's in this room. And as you can see on the left, there's this electrical wall beam. And on the right is this Mandara thing. Looks like a bunch of Buddha clones fucked a bunch of C-3PO's and this is what you get. Alright, so when you begin this battle, you have to destroy all of these statues before they knock you into this wall beam. Oh, and did I forget to mention that this beam is a one-hit kill? Well, now you know. Admittedly though, in fairness, you don't get hurt by touching Mandara itself. You only get knocked back a bit. But you have to kill these statues fast. And I mean fast. Like you're about to shit your pants and need to drop trial quicks fell fast. Fail to do so and it's night night for our ninja hero. Where this battle really goes south though is in the strategy. Or should I say the lack of one. It's so fucking mindless! You just blast the crap out of the statues. That's I-T it. And no, I'm not kidding. You don't dodge any projectiles at first, and there's no skill involved. It's the most basic boss battle ever. I mean, you would think the game designers might want to keep you on your toes like the previous battles and have you dodge attacks or at least run from them, but nope. You just hit it and hit it and hit it. Now you can use your ninja magic to harm and destroy the statues, but you only get one shot. No second ninja magic for you! Worse still, the game makes the statues harder when you first face them and gives them more life, so it's almost a certainty that you'll die. Then later it gives them fewer hit points. Well gee, thanks! So Shinobi's not only a quarter eater, it's a game that excels at being extraordinarily cheap! It makes me so mad that I want to call this game shit Nobi. But let's move on. I found that the best way to defeat Mandara is simple. Blast the crap out of it! Some strategy, huh, fellas? Requires a lot of outside-the-box thinking, am I right? However, there is a little trick you can do to help yourself. If you destroy a statue when it's near you and you use ninja magic, sometimes you can trigger a glitch. The statue on the ground will explode, and if you time it right, you can slip into the other statues as the one above it falls. Keep hitting jump and right, and if it works correctly, you can slip past the other ones. Time the glitch wrong, though, and you waste your magic. Lovely! Great, so now I need a fucking glitch to beat a boss. Well, no, you don't. But I think it shows how poorly programmed this battle is. So anywho, when you finally beat the statues, next comes the second part of the battle. And after the former clusterfuck, this part is insultingly easy. You fight this big mechanical head that goes up and down. Hooray! Yes, big heads. My favorite! When you can't think of something better, just have your hero fight a big fucking head! Originality! Oh, and of course his attack pattern is painfully predictable. It shoots a high bouncing fireball, then a low one, then another high one, then a low one. Unless somebody replaced your brain to whip dog shit, I think you can guess what'll happen next. After a couple of shots, you smoke the boss and end the level. As I've lamented in the past, this boss suffers from the classic too easy, too hard syndrome. With the added bonus of being too fucking cheap. Really, I think they could have done so much better with this battle. Alas, it is what it is, and there's no getting around it. Or through it. So in conclusion, Shinobi is a fucking tough game. 
But I also think that it's a worthy game, despite the aforementioned flawed boss battle. And this is one case where you have to take the good with the bad and power through the latter. I don't know if everybody can remember when they lost their virginity, but I'm sure that damn near every gamer can remember that one level that sent them into a rage during their childhood. And in my case, this is my white whale. My bad Vietnam flashback. Call it what you will. I couldn't forget this fucking level if you dropped a nuclear bomb onto my brain. This level, man. This fucking level. I remember renting this game as a kid and screaming this level pissed me off so fucking much. In fact, it stopped me cold and I will never forget it as long as I live. So let's travel back in time and get some much needed catharsis. Levels from Hell, Abadox for the Nez, the second level. Before I begin, I do want to give two shoutouts in this level's favor. One is for the graphics. They really kick ass! Yes, the game looks disgusting, but that was part of its charm back in the day. It is just insane to think they got away with a game like this. Even now, though, I think the graphics look superb. One wonders, though, where is this game set? The manual says that this alien creature has consumed your homeworld called Abadox and turned it into a big fleshy blob in space. To me, though, this looks like the inside of Kamala Harris's vagina. But that's just me. <laughs> the second great thing about this level is its music. This is one kick-ass tune, folks. Just listen to this. This is one of the best tunes from the NES. And it is one of the few things that won't leave you screaming and rage. So savor its goodness, folks. Savor it dearly. Because now we're moving on to the bad. Oh boy, the bad. Let me tell you something, ladies and germs. This level's cornered the market on fucking bad. Oh sure, it starts out all innocent and sweet, like your neighborhood cock tees. There's wide open spaces and plenty of room to fight and maneuver. But once you beat the mini boss and get deeper in, the claws come out and the cock tease turns into a fucking bitch on wheels! All that wonderful space goes bye bye, and you get an area with all the space of a horsefly's anal tract. Look at how tight this space is! Jesus, how can anybody maneuver in here? I mean, this is almost as bad as the narrow spaces in Hunt for Red October for the Amiga. Oh, and if you touch anything, and I mean anything, you're dead, bucko. Great, so if I fucking fart next to the wall, am I gonna be dead too? Come on, fellas, give me a little more space here! Worse still, if you die, you either go back to the beginning of the level, or it's only a checkpoint and you lose all of your power-ups. Now, losing your weapons is bad enough. But guess what? You lose speed too. And without that, this crap moves about as fast as a Yugo full of Neutronium dildos. So you best collect those speed power-ups pronto, buddy. And as if the game hasn't cornholed you quite enough yet, the enemies are relentless here! There's David Cronenberg's sperm, Prolapse Green rectum shooting radioactive dingleberries at you, fleshy hands trying to jerk you off, and lizard-type thingies, among other enemies. Some of these enemies will be on you faster than Wings of Redemption is on a bowl of Wendy's Chili. So do yourself a big favor, shoot real fast, and don't get hit. As I'm sure you figured out by now, this is one of those fuck-up levels. You just fuck up, bat up, bat up, bat up, bat up, until you shut off the game or have your brains leak out of your ears. To win... You have to position yourself perfectly and memorize every fucking second of this level. There is virtually no margin for error here. We're talking Silver Surfer Nez Tight. 
Oh, by the way, did I forget to mention that there's only one checkpoint halfway through this level? Gee, thanks, game! Don't be too generous or anything! I wouldn't want to feel like I have a chance of winning! Why don't you just have no checkpoints at all? Or delete the whole fucking game after one fail? Really make me feel worthless! Okay, in fairness, the game does have unlimited continues. But seeing how tough this level is, it's like unlimited chances to blowtorch my asshole! When you finally get to the boss, that is, if you get to the boss, it's bad. But not horrendous. A lot of shit flies by, but if you have good weapons and speed, you can dodge these shots and blast the ever-loving fuck out of this, 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 thing. If you don't have power-ups, though, um, you're gonna be here a while. Like a couple thousand decades. And of course we have this wonderful flashing shit. Because I always love the feeling of flashbangs going off in my eyes. Please, wreck my concentration. That's just what I need. The first time I beat this boss and got through all this country, I remember being so pissed off that I quit the game and returned it to the video store. And that was back in the day when game rentals were, what, three, four, maybe five dollars a pop? It's not much now, but it wasn't cheap back then, let me tell you. That's how much this fucking level pissed me off. And it still does. Looking back, I'm so glad I quit this game back then and now, because it wasn't worth going any further. So in conclusion, it's a shame about this level. I think they ramped up the difficulty level here way too fast, even for a NES game. If this level had been a bit easier and more forgiving, I don't think it would be levels from Hell material. Unfortunately, it ran me through the goddamn meat grinder, so I'm well within my rights to give it a few lumps back. Russian Attack is an adaptation of the 80s arcade game. Now they changed up a lot for the adaptation, but nowhere is it more apparent than in the final boss battle. And let's just say that they didn't improve upon the original. Quite the opposite, in fact. So anyway, let's get into it. Stupid boss battles. Russian attack for the Nez. The final boss. When the game starts out, it gives you a brief cutscene. Now this sets up the fact that your mission is to destroy the enemy's secret weapon! I guess it wasn't much of a fucking secret if a bunch of people know about it, but whatever. In any case, I hear the term secret weapon, and I expect something big and ferocious. Maybe like a metal gear or an army of 10,000 invincible super soldiers or a big death laser in orbit. But what does this game give you? Why a big glowing nuclear missile? Um, okay. Color me underwhelmed. Alright, to be fair, this was an 80s NES game. So you can't expect that much. But a big nuke, guys? Really? If this wet fart of a boss was their big secret, then really, it wasn't worth keeping secret in the first place. And not to get too into Cold War geopolitics, but why another nuclear missile? The Russians in the game already have like 10,000 of them as shown in the first level. So again, why another one? What makes it so special? What, is it like a super neutron bomb that can nuke every American city but leave the infrastructure intact? Or does this baby blow up half the world? Didn't they ever hear of deterrence and mutually assured destruction? If things ever escalated to a full-scale nuclear war back then, or even now, we'd all be toast. So again, dear viewers, I ask you, why have this light bright of a nuke? I guess I'm a fool for trying to apply any real-world logic or sense to an 80s video game. It's there because, well, it's like the Mount Everest principle. It's there because, well, it's there. So anywho, you knife about 5 billion Ruskies and get past a bunch of lasers, then you face the bomb. And if you want to ignore the lack of imagination or reality, fine by me. But even for a final boss, this battle ain't the most complicated thing ever. All you have to do is kill some of these yellow fuckers. They give you three rocket launcher shots, then you hit the nuke three times, and do it again. And this boss just sits there like a dog turd on the side of the highway. There's no more lasers or machine guns. I guess those commie bastards ran out of money for their big secret weapon, and they couldn't afford any more security. Maybe it's just me, but if I was building this big secret weapon, I'd have a little more protection. That's just me, though. 
My biggest problem with this boss battle is that it's way too easy. Kill a couple of Stalin's pole smokers, launch a couple of RPGs, and bam, you win. That's it! No second form, no other defenses, nothing. Okay, maybe this battle isn't quite as easy as some of the other ones I've covered in the past. But still, it's too easy, folks. They really could have done better. This is like a D at best. Maybe a C minus if I'm being generous. Admittedly, if you lose all your lives, it's game over and you can't continue. But come on! This battle is easy city. Unless somebody took a cinder block to your head or you drank yourself shit based on cores last night, I don't see how you could lose this fight. Then the real beauty of the battle comes with this ending. The whole fucking place blows up behind the guy and he flees. I guess Commander Numbnuts isn't worried about the shockwave or any residual radioactive fallout from the enemy's secret weapon. And then the game says I saved the world and peace has come at last. <laughs> really? How? By causing another Chernobyl and starting a nuclear war? Yeah, I'm sure that'll bring about world peace. I get the feeling that the game designers didn't think through the implications of their ending. Or the game, for that matter. Then again, they had a nice cheap pun for a title, so maybe they just didn't care. Like a number of stupid boss battles, I have to wonder if they just ran out of time and had to slap something together quickly. Sure feels like it in this case. But whatever the reasons, you ain't exactly gonna be rushing out to play this one again! <laughs> I'm sorry. So in conclusion, Russian Attack is a decent game. But if you're looking for a memorable final boss battle, you'd do better to look elsewhere. If one were to judge a game based solely on the cover art, then Dr. Chaos would look like the most awesome game ever. I mean, look at this. You got this heroic looking blonde guy with a knife and a pool of blood beneath him. And you got this skeleton demon-like thing with wings looming over him and all these other monsters around him. This cover art looks fucking awesome! Sign me up! Unfortunately, the game itself can't deliver on the promise of the advertising, and it ends up just being an abysmal failure. So anyway, let's get into it. Dr. Chaos for the NES. When you start out, the game continues to trick you into thinking it could be terrific. It has the Dr. Chaos title in blood, and a creepy haunted house. Enjoy what few illusions you have though, my friends, because once you press start, reality will come crashing down on you. Now this game's graphics look like many things. Scary ain't one of them though. Yeah, all right, it's 8-bit NES from 1988, and you can't expect the impossible. Still, the in-game graphics could have looked creepier. Just look at Uninvited for the NES. That game is fucking scary, and it's mostly a text game with few moving graphics. Alright, I'll admit it. The graphics are good for the time. Our hero looks big, and the sprites are colorful. He's not blonde like the cover art, but I'm fine with that. And the house is, well, a house. I think the problem here, though, is that the game looks too bright for a horror game. Sometimes that can work well, like contrasting light with hidden darkness. Here, though, it doesn't. Another problem with the graphics are these first-person sections. Everything looks damn near the same, so good luck figuring out where you are. Along with those graphical issues, many of the enemies don't look too threatening. In this first part, you got bats and mice. Okay, maybe they got rabies and hantavirus. Still, I'm not getting the shivers here, folks. Truth be told, the mice kind of look, well, cute to me. Yet to be fair, a few of the enemies do look scary. Like this big fucker that comes out of nowhere from one of the rooms. But really, it's more of a jump scare than legitimately creepy scare. Beyond that, another thing that's scary for all the wrong reasons are the controls. 
This game has a truly dreadful control scheme that will make you crap your pants with fear. Okay, so the basic controls are simple. In the side-scrolling areas, the directional pad allows you to move in the usual directions. Left moves left, right moves right. Down ducks. B uses your weapons, and A jumps. As you can see, you have a knife, a pistol, and what the manual calls a machine gun. Though it looks more like a Tech 9 to me. Select allows you to select the weapons. Oh yeah, and there's also grenades that hurt or kill everything on screen, including you! In addition, there's the controls for the first person sections. You move this hand up, down, left, and right with the D-pad like a cursor. Now when you get to certain objects, the game gives you a choice of commands. Open, get, go, and hit. And I found the controls to be a bit confusing here. You hold B and press up or down to select a command, then A to do it. I think it would have worked better to use select to select the commands and A or B to pick one, but what do I know? Open is to open doors, windows, and cabinets. Get is to grab items. Go is to go into another room. And hit is to hit objects. Fair enough. Unfortunately, the hand cursor is a little bit sluggish. It's not terrible, mind you, but it's less responsive than it could have been. And this is a problem in a game where you have to be in first-person POV a lot. Also, in the third-person sections, our hero doesn't exactly move and fight the greatest. His jump is odd and floaty, and his knife has all the range of a snail's puckered asshole. Sure, you can use your guns, but they have limited ammo. Even more annoying, though, is that our hero can't shoot upwards. Just forward and in a crouch. Alright, maybe that's okay in other games like the Mega Man series, but those games actually have good controls and a plethora of weapons to choose from. From there, we move on to the gameplay. And here's where the game sucks the proverbial big one. This game literally doesn't give you a fucking clue as to what to do or where to go. Instead, it drops you right into the middle of the ocean and tosses a fucking anvil at you. To beat this game without a walkthrough, you'd have to be some kind of genius on the order of Einstein. I'm clearly not one. I'm just a schmuck. So naturally, I got totally lost. Even with a walkthrough, though, this game is still no walk in the park. Get this. The game actually expects you to open these random windows, or whatever the fuck they are, and go into them to enter warp zones. Oh, what a brilliant piece of gameplay. By the way, there's no map to speak of. No map, no clues, no shit. Just go figure it out for yourself there, boyo, and fuck off. I am in awe at how arrogant the game designers were and just expecting you to figure it all out without any context. And yeah, to be totally fair, a good number of NES games were like this. But even other games give you a few shitty hints. This one can't even be fucking bothered to do that. Look, folks, I tried to give this game a fair shot. But I couldn't get very far without a walkthrough. And even with a guide, this game is still dull. Let me explain quickly what you have to do. Our hero has to assemble a weapon to nuke the main villain named Cannabis or Canada the Barbarian or whatever the fuck this fart knocker's name is. Fine. But this weapon is broken up into several parts and you have to go into all these warp zones to collect the pieces. Yes, one piece at a time. Oh yeah, and you have to get other shit too. Now maybe five, six, or seven at most of these bits would be bearable. However, this game expects you to do over ten of them. No sane kid would ever have the patience to do this. Hell, hardly any sane adult would either. I know I don't. I got past two warp zones before I tapped out. This game is too boring to be endured. I'd rather pump a colony full of angry fire ants up my ass than play one more minute of this shit. So anyway, before I go totally nuclear, I do have to give this game a modicum of credit, because it does have a password system. 
The problem here, though, is that it's one of these Byzantine password systems that even Mensa members would have trouble using. Beautiful! And people wonder why nobody wants to play games like this one anymore. Like it's a big mystery for the ages! Just for shits and giggles, though, I decided to try the final password to see how the game wrapped up. And oh boy, is it a funner! The main good guy ends up with a fucking motorcycle helmet on his head. Don't ask me how he got it. Then he has to stab some fucking lion-headed thing with a knife and shoot it with a laser beam a couple times. After he wins, he gets reunited with his brother, and you get a crappy ending. Oh, I'm great! That just warms the cockles of my fucking heart. You know something that isn't great, though? This fucking game! Finally, the music is the only other thing in this game that's decent. Here, listen. Sadly, it can't save the game. This one is like the Hindenburg, going down in flames. To wrap things up, I think this is one of those games that actually might have worked better on a superior system, like the PS1 or the Xbox. If it could be remade with better graphics, a mapping system, some actual fucking clues, and better gameplay, it might actually be a decent survival horror game. But the NES version is a total dud, and the only horror you'll get out of the whole affair is suffering through its awfulness. So in conclusion, Dr. Chaos for the NES should be sued for malpractice, because it fails to do its job on all fronts. It's not scary, it's boring, and it isn't even worth playing as a novelty. Just give it a pass and play a better horror game, because God knows there's plenty of them. I can say that I've played a lot of games in my time, but I've never played a game quite like this. So let's jump right into it. Uncle Pooh for the arcade! Let's get down to brass tacks. This game isn't much to look at, but what do you expect? It was made all the way back in 1983. And even for 83, it looks, eh, pretty poo. No pun intended. The opening screen looks, um... Yeah. This is our hero. The eponymous Uncle Pooh. Don't ask me why they decide to have a hero who looks like an 8,000 year old semi-toothless hobo. But I guess it is what it is, so we're stuck with it. As for the backgrounds, eh, they're okay. To me, the whole thing looks like Dig Dug on welfare. Not a whole lot of colors or textures, but it gets the job done. The controls are dirt simple. One button allows Uncle Pooh to move fast with his roller skates, and the other one allows him to, um, fart. Yes, farts, folks. Farts! Uncle Pooh destroys his enemies by farting on them! Jesus Christ, I've seen some crazy things in my time, but this is something else. I just... I, I can't. He farts bubbles that bounce off the walls. I guess I should be grateful he doesn't shit on him. Gee, thanks for small favors. I don't know how in the world the ABGN missed reviewing this game, given his penchant for all things scatological. In any case, one small complaint I do have with the game is that sometimes it's hard to move Uncle Pooh in between these blocks, even after you blast holes in them. I wish his farts had more destructive range. Great, I can't believe I've actually made a criticism about farts in a review. But let's move on. As for gameplay, it's also basic. You start out in a maze-like level. On your left, water is rushing in to flood the area. Touch the water, and you lose a life. To escape and win the level, you have to collect a number of these diamonds. But there are blocks in the way. And to destroy these blocks, yeah, you fart on them. Lovely! It's good to know that if any enemies or obstacles get in my way in real life, I can just destroy them with my farts! You learn something new every day! However, there is a catch. Isn't there always? 
See this little power meter down here? Every time Uncle Pooh farts or roller skates, it uses up power. Run out of power and poor Uncle Pooh can't fart or skate anymore. To replenish it, you have to collect these bunny sacks. Um, how does that work exactly? Does he shove the money up his ass to power his farts? Or does he buy farts from a fart store in his spare time? Oh, film and stuff, don't even bother trying to figure this one out. Just roll with it. So when he collects the money, it also makes the on-screen blocks go away. And like I said, the money also allows you to skate again. Uh, yeah. I'm sure a bunch of 80-year-olds could roller skate going 50 miles an hour if you just threw money at them. Really, there's not much else to this game. In each subsequent level, there are faster enemies, more obstacles, and more, um, farts. You just keep on playing until you run out of lives, and then you have to start all over again. This game barely has any music, and what little it does have isn't worth mentioning. Though I did find Uncle Pooh's fart sound effect to be funny. Sounds like a Dalek getting an anemone. Overall, I have just one question. How in the hell did this game ever get made? Seriously, I'd like to know! Jesus, there are some weird-ass forgotten games out there, but this one takes the cake! I suppose it's not a surprise to say that this game came out in Japan, because they have some really weird-ass games over there. But still, think about it. There's an actual arcade game out there where an old man uses his farts as a weapon. Really, folks, you just can't make shit like this up. So in conclusion, I'd suggest playing this game because it's a real gas! Ha ha! I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. But seriously, it's a fun little time waster. And if nothing else, you can say you played a game where an old man killed his enemies with his flatulence. <laughs>